Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pathfinders, the podcast series from RBC Capital Markets that explores the fast-moving world of biopharma. I'm Chris McCarthy, Managing Director and Healthcare Death Sector Strategist at RBC Capital Markets, and I'm here today with Otello Stampaccia, PhD, Founder and Managing Director of Omega Funds, and Ben Snedeker, Senior Pharmaceutical and Specialty Pharma Analyst at HealthCore Management, to take the temperature of biotech and the wider healthcare sector today. Otello founded Omega Funds in 2004 and leads the firm's investor relations and strategic initiatives. He is a member of the firm's investment committee and is also heavily involved in a number of Omega's therapeutic areas of interest, particularly in oncology, rare diseases, and inflammatory disorders. Ben has been with HealthCore since 2019 after serving as therapeutics analyst at Point State Capital. He was also a portfolio manager with D.E. Shaw and worked as an associate principal in the pharmaceutical and medical products practice at McKinsey and Company from 2000 to 2006. Ben Otello, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's jump right into it. Uh, Let's talk about where we are in the sector. Maybe what's the one less discussed dynamic out there that's affecting the market today? Otello, why don't we start with you? I do think there's been a, a bit of a negative trend in public markets for the last year or so. Uh, and I think there's been a number of factors uh, mentioned as potential causing that downdraft um, from, you know, renewed discussion on drug pricing, perceived lack of M&A, uh, you know, drawdowns from funds, uh, performance of IPOs. Perhaps one factor that has not been as discussed, uh, I believe, are two things, I guess. One is the the reduced volume uh, from retail traders. Um, And as many of you know, there's been a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands in the early phases of the pandemic, which led to an explosion of retail trading. Um, Some of them found its way into into more speculative stocks like Biosec. And I think with the reduction of those trading volumes and, and less attention from those traders, I think we've also seen a, a bit of a negative feedback loop with certain ETFs that have been quite exposed to the to the sector. The, the first one that comes to mind is the ARC-G, uh, ARC Innovation Funds ETFs. Uh, and those have been certainly very uh, much, uh, you know, redeeming a lot of capital in the last few, few months and probably the last year as well. So that, that creates a bit of a contribution to, to the trading dynamic we have seen, in my opinion. Ben, what's your take? Yeah, uh, Chris, thanks uh, Thanks for having me. And uh, maybe just to start, just one uh, quick disclosure, uh, all of the opinions that I'm going to share today are uh, are mine and, and mine alone. And I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of only me and not on behalf of, of HealthCorp. Uh, with that said, I think you know, as I think about your question, I think, okay, where are we right now? I think one of the topics that's really sort of foremost on, on people's minds is, you know, where do we sit within what is currently the longest and, and some could argue the deepest biotech bear market uh, that we've seen in, in nearly 20 years? I think that as you look at long-term performance in the therapeutic sector, uh, the best correlation between long-term outperformance in, in the therapeutic sector is really revenue growth and expectations for revenue growth. But what's interesting is if you look at the dynamic that drives the most short-term outperformance, it most closely correlates with fund flows. And what follows from that is new listings of companies. And so what's interesting here is that I think we came through a period in that 2019 to early 2021, where you were really seeing just incredible fund flows into therapeutics, an incredible number of new listings. And we saw a really meaningful increase uh, in that uh, short-term outperformance based on those fund flows. I think the challenge has been that we weren't able to convert that, that uh, you know, explosion in fund flows into a, an opportunity to say, okay, now we can start to see you know, meaningful long-term revenue growth. And I think that where we find ourselves right now is that you have a market that is trying to correct for what was outstanding short-term performance, 
but is not really you know, set up for attractive long-term performance if we think about revenue growth as a primary driver of that performance. Let's stick with you, Ben. Uh, where are the investment opportunities? And by the way, I'm not talking about how the safer commercial names will trade up first. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a great question. And you know, I think that I'll go back to, to what I said previously. If we think about the best correlation with long-term therapeutics outperformance is the opportunity for meaningful revenue growth. I think that's really where the opportunity remains uh, you know, in, in the current market. And what's interesting here is you know, it's, it comes back to the point you made, which is you, know, you don't want to say, all right, the safe commercial names are, 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 going, to, you know, are going to move first. I think what we need to look at is we need to say, well, where are those companies that the potential for revenue growth, the, the potential for revenue outperformance are not appropriately priced, right? That risk is not appropriately priced. And what I'd argue is that for the safer commercial names, typically those, excuse me, those companies are well covered. You know, those, those safer commercial names are pretty well understood. And I think that the revenue growth potential uh, of those companies is for the most part well reflected in their valuation. So where that leaves you is you say, to find the opportunities, you need to find those companies where that revenue potential is currently mispriced by the market. And that can be uh, you know, companies that are pursuing new drug launches, uh, that can be you know, drugs that are finding new geographies and new indications where they can grow. It can also be clinical stage companies where you're getting far enough along that you can start to de-risk uh, the revenue potential from a clinical asset. And you know, it doesn't have to be that the product's in the market and that it's selling. It just has to be that you have uh, some line of sight to revenue growth that you feel that you can appropriately adjust the risk that that revenue is gonna become real. I think one of the things we've seen is that we've seen a move toward companies that are you know, very far from being able to generate revenue. You can't actually effectively risk adjust revenue, let's say for a pre IND company or a company that's telling you that the key event for their investment thesis is the filing of an IND. That's not an event where we can actually risk adjust revenue potential. So the way I, where I'd finish here is I'd say, if we look at the opportunity, it really is in those companies where you, you look at them and you identify that the market is, in your mind, inappropriately pricing the risk of the revenue potential of the company. And those are, to me, the companies that are going to lead us out of you know, what we've, we've just been describing is one of the certainly longest and also close to the deepest therapeutic spare market uh, that we've seen in 20 years. Otello, where do you see the opportunities? Yeah, so we play in a slightly different uh, part of the park, I guess, than, than Ben. So we do predominantly company creation, private, you know, venture capital financing, occasionally pipes. Uh, I mean, and, and to be completely transparent, the last couple of years have been a little bit tricky on some elements of our investment strategy because of pricing expectations where people were benchmarking some late stage private financings to the valuation of public companies that were at least in the, you know, uh, 12 months ago and, and further out were pretty healthy. Uh, so we had to remain extremely disciplined on valuation. I, I do think the, the company creation part of the ecosystem is fairly unflexible. Uh, the rate limiting steps, there are really exceptional ideas for products and platforms, as well as exceptional management. There's just not a huge supply of that. So there would always be capacity constraint that segment. I think the opposite end of the spectrum on the private side is probably where there are, you know, at least soon, if not already now, probably more opportunities because some companies were extremely bullish on being able to raise what they would call crossover mezzanine financings and immediately go public. And I realize, and they realize now that there's no longer certainty. So I think going back to fundamentals is always healthy and fundamentals are you should finance these companies for several years and get, get good clinical data. Um, and I think that was a little bit tricky in that segment for the last couple of years. So I look forward to getting back into it. 
But, you know, there's also, to be completely honest, there's also probably a lot of opportunities in the public markets right now. There's, uh, I forget what the exact number is, but I believe over 120 companies that are trading below cash. Um, and uh, some stage uh, that, that is in, a fi- in an efficiency that needs to be arbitraged out. Patello, sticking with you, COVID-19 has certainly changed the healthcare industry. And it's something of an irony that biotech created the vaccine and more or less saved the world, but now the sector's down 50%. Right. That's how I think about it. But how do, you, how do you see the impacts of COVID? Yeah, I mean, removing a little bit the discussion from the public performance. And if you try to take a step back and, you know, to be clear, it's always hard to understand history as you're living it. And I do really think we're living through an historical inflection point uh, at many, many levels, uh, including lately the geopolitical. But, but you're right. I mean, the, the race for vaccines, antibodies, oral antivirals has been nothing short of miraculous. And I, I don't really know how much people appreciate this, but in a, in a span of less than a year, we had antibodies approved and, and several vaccines, two of which were arguably the most effective vaccines in the history of mankind. There's been an incredible uh, focus shift from academics, industry, on research on this virus. And uh, again, this is giving a ridiculous amount of insight on how our immune system works in interacting with viruses, but also in interacting uh, to, to, with host uh, factors. So I think the repercussions in terms of dividends from this research for not just antiviral research, but in general, for autoimmune, rare diseases and so on, is gonna be phenomenal. Uh, and I really think there's been a massive step up in, in the pace. You know, I think Attila makes a fantastic point when he mentions that we don't always appreciate history while we're living it. Um, you know, I think when we look back and we really start to understand just how much impact uh, coronavirus has had uh, you know, and I'll, I'll focus just on, on the industry, um, I think it's going to be massive and it's going to be in a lot of ways that we didn't necessarily appreciate at the time. One of the biggest changes with coronavirus is that it's forced us to completely rethink the speed with which companies can innovate and the speed with which regulatory bodies uh, can review and support those innovations and also then the speed with which you can ramp uh, production and distribution in order to meet some urgent need. And then for those products to actually have an impact, a tangible impact on the trajectory of disease, I think we've had to completely rewrite sort of what we assume in terms of the speed with which the industry can move. I think that one of the challenges we see is that I think that many investors, especially, and to my sense, some companies have viewed this as a, uh, a difference in how the market's going to operate going forward. And you know, I think that that's created one of the challenges on, on this idea that you know, uh, accelerated pathways to market, accelerated ramps in, in product launches, very rapid moves toward uh, substantial uh, revenue potential for newly launched products. I think these are all dynamics that are currently believed to exist in the market because of what we saw from coronavirus and how it changed our outlook on how industry can can take a product from you know from early innovation all the way to market and i think that we're dealing with some of that fallout now where we need to recognize that you know a product being developed sort of run of the course for you know important diseases but not necessarily for global pandemics are going to have a different looking path to market than what we saw for pandemic therapy or, or, or pandemic diagnostic or whatever it happens to be. Ben, let's stick with you. Um, how do biotech bear markets end? Uh, you know, I think we often hear about M&A hope, but is the reality, you know, more a combination of pipe transactions, uh, what I'll call like a merger of weak wolves, uh, bankruptcies and, and fund closures running their course? What's your take there? Yeah, it's a great question. Merger of equals, by the way, is a is a pretty humorous uh, humorous term. In public equities, if we look at prior bear markets, and you know, if I kind of think of the last twenty years, 
depending on what metric you want to use, maybe what index you use as reference, there have been either two or four uh, bear markets. And I think in all of those cases, the way that bear markets end is that they end quietly. And they end with positioning getting cleaned up, uh, sort of, you know, a you know, valuations, you know, falling, I, I'll say back to earth, but, you know, valuations dropping to, you know, what investors start to say are, is a more reasonable level. And I'll say more reasonable as defined by a willingness to deploy capital into those opportunities. And, you know, if, if we look back historically, what you see is that following a, a bear market, it's a slow grind back. You have a few companies that lead the way initially, others start to catch up. Sometimes there are elements, things like um, you know, M&A activity, merger activity, but that's really more the exception than the rule in terms of how bear markets end. Botello, what's your take on biotech bear markets and how they end? It's a contribution of various factors. Some people have to overperform. The FDA needs to go back to do you know, assessment and give out uh, less CRLs. There's now new leadership at the FDA, which I think is helpful. I do think M&A would play a role. Uh, I don't know how meaningful it would be, um, but, but if you look even at the last you know, couple of years, people have been complaining there isn't enough M&A, but the reality is actually less dollar volume, but in terms of absolute volume, in terms of number of deals, it's actually up. And, and this is because in the current context, it's going to be really hard for pharma to do, uh, you know, mergers of equals uh, on, on the pharma side or large company side. So I think that this skews potential discussions in favor of smaller companies, which is where most of the innovation is anyway. So I do think it would play a role, but I agree, it's not going to be like a week where there's five, six mergers and the XPI goes up 60%, right? It's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, I do think the drug pricing rhetoric, just because of the change in attitudes in Congress, is something to keep an eye on. I'm kind of encouraged by the latest news there in terms of focusing a little bit more on the role of PBMs versus innovators. And I do think, by the way, the pandemic has had an influence on lawmakers, making them understand how strategic this industry is. And by the way, I'm starting to see the same in Europe. But again, Ben is fundamentally right. There's going to be a number of factors over a period of time. And I think they will create a lot of opportunities for people with conviction to, to make some great investments. Ben, let's stick with you on biotech catalysts. Uh, why is the batting average so poor lately? Most I speak to don't think it's a run-of-the-mill slump at the plate, but attribute it to more inside baseball. What's your take? Yes, yeah, so Chris, it's a great question. And it's one that I think everybody is wrestling with and trying to understand. And I would agree with you. I think you know, my view is that this isn't just run of the mill, uh, right? It's not just, hey, this is kind of you know, how risk goes and, and we just happen to be in a lull. I think there is something more structural that's going on. And, and I think that the question encapsulates a lot of the topics that, that we've been touching on. And, and again, this is strictly speculation. I don't think anybody really knows uh, but if I had to share with you my guess on why it seems like we're in such a slump on the catalysts that have been coming through, yeah, I, I think it comes back to a few things. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I think part of this is that, you know, the funding cycle, which we talked about earlier, has been so robust and there's been so many companies attracting so much capital that while there are, without a doubt, multiple outstanding companies, that are attracting that capital. I think there are others that are also attracting a larger amount of capital at either an earlier stage or with less external diligence than tends to occur in a period where maybe the funding isn't quite so available. And so I think that we, we skew toward potentially some uh, higher risk events as a result of that dynamic. I think a second piece is that you know, anytime you're in a, bull, a biotech bull market. And you know, I, we talked about it earlier, but I would say the, the bull market really started to pick up in 2019 and it ran through the early part of 2021. But you could even roll it back a little bit further and say even in 2018, we were starting to see uh, signs that we we're moving into, a, into an attractive 
biotech market. And I think what we see in these big bull markets is that you see a substantial amount of employee turnover. And it's the opportunity for, uh, you know, for employees in the therapeutic space uh, to take some risk, uh, to move to smaller companies, to work on really cutting edge, you know, innovative science. I think part of the challenge with that though is that you get so much employee turnover in bull markets, and, and we all see the articles about how challenging it is to hire and, and keep people. I think that turnover, you know, invariably can lead to risk within an R and D organization. You know, there tends to be, uh, you know, I would say a core group of people that tend to be most focused on any individual program or individual catalyst, as we're calling it. And when you get a lot of turnover among that employee base, I think it can increase uh, the risk in uh, in that program. And I think a lot of the catalysts they're reading out now are uh, programs that were maturing in that period of time when we were figuring out how to work in a new way. And I do think that you know, while it's absolutely possible to work either in a remote setting or a hybrid setting, I do think that a lot of these programs uh, may be suffering from maturing during a period when we were still kind of trying to figure out how to do that which I think in, in some cases may have raised the risk on, on how those catalysts were going to read out. Patello, what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, it's hard uh, to disagree, right? So again, Ben makes some, some excellent points. As always, it's a multifactorial issue. Uh, I mean, in terms of batting average, a little bit depends on the definition, right? Are we talking phase two, phase three, successful success rates, or are we talking, you know, uh, meaningful, you know, commercial launches? I think in a pandemic, uh, there, there's been real challenges to enroll in patients in some indications, particularly oncology and other very vulnerable populations. So that's been, in my opinion, a huge factor that has delayed recruitment and in some cases made, made very difficult. And, and in some cases that also increases friction uh, in terms of the positive outcomes of some of these trials. So that's definitely something that we have been extremely worried and, and had many, many discussions across our portfolio on how to correct for. Uh, again, FDA also another issue. I think they, they dedicated so much uh, time and resources to the emergency in the pandemic that some of the other areas are probably um, you know, suffered. I think at the end of the day, it also depends on the diseases that you focus on, and we, we treat really, really focus within the firm on areas of extremely unmet medical need, where I think some of these factors are less of a concern uh, in terms of you know attention from the FDA recruiting and so on. But still, uh, I mean, it's it's hard to say that nobody's affected. So I think the denominator effect that Ben mentioned probably deserves an extended look because. I mean, there's a lot more companies now that are public after the pretty unprecedented, in my opinion, number of IPOs over the last two, three years. Uh, and I think that that is also an implication in terms of the attention span from public investors. It's really hard to focus on such a much larger universe. And because it's so much larger as a universe, uh, some people probably are not doing the same depth of work that they were doing in the past. And there's also been a number of new entrants. So I think it's all interconnected. Uh, I do think with some, you know, pause for reflection uh, for higher quality programs, I think we will hopefully see some of these uh, batting averages improve over time. But, but this is a business of exception. Uh, and, it, and it builds and, and it behooves investors like ours to understand how do we get better and picking up those those exceptional companies. That's really our job. Patella, let's stick with you as we wrap it up. Um, let's get more granular at the end here uh, and how you both invest in healthcare and how all the topics discussed impact your forward view. Otello? Yeah, I mean, this could be, again, a, a whole conference on its own but, but or, or podcast on its own. But I think, you know, we always try to be extremely granular, for lack of a better word, in, in identifying areas of unmet medical need, what's missing, what, what right drugs or, or modalities will make sense. Another area where we spend a lot of time internally is, is really clinical trial development strategy and competitive analysis. This is an area that I 
think is incredibly difficult to get right because it's just so much out there and it requires quite a you know very very deep understanding and, and, and analysis uh, i have to say i'm extremely proud of the fact that we invested in companies that have launched 47 products which i think is quite unprecedented in our segment of the industry uh, and and each of those drugs and products that come with learnings that we apply throughout our investment strategy so having perhaps a certain amount of you know uh staying power if you will in the industry i think it's disproportionately impactful Ben, what's your take on how all these topics shape your forward view? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, to Attila's point, we could probably talk about this all day and then some, but to try and distill it down as much as possible, I think we continue, like Otello mentioned, we focus very much on, on the individual company at, at the most granular level. And the investments still need to be fundamentally driven uh, you know, companies with outstanding products, uh, excellent innovation, a track record of success, management teams with a strong execution track record, the ability to communicate effectively, you know, companies that are, that are well-funded and match up against important themes that we see, uh, let's say from a disease perspective, all of that remains absolutely true. I think one area that, that we've been very focused on, uh, it started with coronavirus, it's continued through, through discussion on things like uh, inflation and rates and now into geopolitical uncertainty, is just more focus on always being certain that we're being macro aware in the portfolio. And we're going to remain uh, fundamental investors focused on individual companies within the healthcare ecosystem but that all needs to be viewed through the lens of, of being, you know, again, I'll use the term macro aware. And, and we've, as much as possible, we've, we've built um, elements into the investment process to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that we are uh, macro aware. But at the end of the day, it comes back to finding great companies, uh, great products, where we believe that the market is mispricing the risk around that company in some way. Uh, you know, and I'll kind of circle back to the, the point that I made early on. You know, we really do focus on the opportunity for these companies to drive tangible revenue growth. And if we can find great products with a great team where we believe that that opportunity, uh, whether near term, medium term or long term, but the opportunity to drive uh, you know, meaningful innovation for patients that will translate into outstanding revenue growth. When that risk is mispriced in an outstanding company, that continues to be where we're going to focus uh, our investments. Well, thank you, Ben and Otello, for your time and your insights. Uh, what else can we expect from markets and this constantly evolving industry in the year ahead? We'll be tracking them right here on Pathfinders. So until our next episode, thank you for joining us. And if there are any topics we discussed that you'd like more information on, please contact us directly or visit our website for more insights at www.rbccm.com forward slash biopharma. Thank you. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives. For disclosures, please visit www.rbccm.com disclosure.